But what's quite interesting when we talk about the lie, man, is that some believe because we see this sort of imagination happening, it's the time when humans started to realise they weren't just another animal, which is what you're sort of indicating there with the Aborigines, that they were different, which means they start having, they'll start understanding their consciousness Mm-hmm. And therefore, that would infer that they were starting to have what we would consider religious thought at that time. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Faithscape, a series dedicated to the exploration of myth and religion. My name is Simon, and I'll be hosting this show over the coming years with the expressed desire to learn more about the nature of faith and belief. My hope is that over the course of these discussions, we'll come to a greater understanding of what religion truly is. Is it a guiding force of purpose and meaning, or perhaps just a primitive attempt at defining the nature of reality? Some would argue that in the 21st century, religion has become a vestigial ideology, with science becoming the main guiding force of truth and knowledge. However, my hope is that by exploring both these perspectives, we may gain a deeper insight into the mysteries of the cosmos. Perhaps between these two opposing viewpoints, we can find a more nuanced understanding of our existence, one that can be expressed in both the formulas of science and the symbols of religion. Today I have the privilege of speaking with John White, an esteemed mythologist and historian whose insights have played a vital role in deciphering the journey of myth and religion. John is a scholar whose expertise lies in the field of Indo-European mythology and ancient culture. He is the producer of the renowned YouTube channel Crackenford. I, like many of you, have been enthralled by his videos which delve into the comparative nature of myth and religion. From the Vikings to the Vedas, or Zeus to Zoroastrianism, he fearlessly explores the intricate threads that bind our global heritage. Aside from storytelling, John is also the mastermind behind the Mythology Database, an extensive online resource which documents myths and legends from around the world. Through his meticulous research, he has shed light on the profound impact that religion has had on our everyday lives, exploring topics that lay the very foundation of the world we inhabit. Today, I am privileged to draw upon John's invaluable knowledge as we delve deeper into the evolution of myth and religion. In this discussion, we focused on the European branch of the tree, with an emphasis on the prehistoric and Neolithic eras. Through his expertise, John brought to life the enchanting journey of religion as it migrated out of Africa before entering the fertile lands of Europe. It is here we find some of the earliest expressions of art and myth, as well as the emergence of anthropomorphic gods. So without further ado, let us embark on a captivating exploration of the history of religion with John White. Hi John, welcome to Faithscape. Uh, How are we doing? Hi, Simon. Oh, I am tip top. Thank you. So I was hoping I could talk to you today about my tree of religion, uh, which I've been working hard on. And I was hoping Mm -hmm. you could give me a critique on it and also uh, give me a bit of an overview of the history, because I'm in phase one of the tree at the moment, which is looking at the broad brushstrokes, which is the history (laughs) and the migration of humans and so on. Um, And along the way, as we're discussing it, feel free to butt in any time and drop a little critique. If you see something that you think is a bit off or you think I could add something, it's just a a moment for me to just, you know, when I edit this later, I can go over it and adjust it on the tree. Uh, So the idea is today I want to start in Africa and work up uh, into the European branch and then we'll stay in Europe for the rest of the talk. And we're going to study the Stone Age, the Agricultural Age, the Bronze Age, and then from the Axial Age up to, to, to Contemporary Era. Uh, so again, a very broad brushstroke. So I won't. I don't want to do into. I don't want to do a too deep a dive at the moment, if that's mm-hmm. okay. That's yeah, fine. So are we okay to go ahead? Let's go. Let's go. All right. Let's dig in then. So I'm just going to bring up my infographic, which is here. Mm-hmm. So uh, as you can see, I've got all the world's religions nested into different colours on the branches of the tree. So each branch represents a specific region. For instance, if I zoom in here to the Middle East. You can see we've got uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. So all the major religions emerging in the Middle East. And if I zoom out, uh, 
the branch I'm focused on today is the green one, which is Europe. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to go right down to the bottom, if that's okay. And this place to start on this map, I think. It began in Africa. <laughs> Have you heard what, that you... by the Chemical Brothers? <laughs> no, I haven't. Oh, it's a brilliant. I'll, I'll send you okay. a link later. Brilliant track. Um, it began so in Africa. It began in Africa. Well, Kirk, what, Kirk, Kirk. Okay, it it there, there's an interesting. It began. What is it? It religious practice began in. Africa. Yes, let's start okay. there because um, the question is, did did it did it did religion originate? Uh, uh, Homo sapiens, uh, or shall I go back further and say the hominids? We 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 can say safely that they originated from Africa. Is that right? We yeah we were sure that hominids originated in Africa and all the DNA of humans or every every human outside of Africa has DNA from an African ancestor lurking okay. within them. So it gets interesting now because uh, you gave me a bit of advice a couple of months ago when I was working on the tree about the Brunicquil cave in indeed France. In, in France, uh, mm -hmm. which is 175,000 BCE. So I just so everybody knows, I had to extend the date of my tree because of that one compelling bit of information. So uh, if I go to the far side here on my timeline, uh, it was originally like about 90,000 BCE I started mm -hmm. the tree. So I had to push it back by about uh, 80,000 years to accommodate all these extra things you were showing me. You're welcome. <laughs> so, thank you for that. That was... <laughs> I had to, it's a lot of uh, space that it created. I was like, oh gosh. That is a fascinating um, thing though, they, they, what they found there. So briefly, just so people understand what is probably the oldest ritual evidence we have. Um, and this is Neanderthals who have cut up bones to be exactly the same length. And there's two different length bones within this ritual uh, place where they've made a circle and in their circle they burnt uh, fat, probably from some kind of animal, maybe an elephant or, or a mammoth or something, um, and they burn fat around it and burn things within it at the at the back of a cave. So they've gone into the main cave, gone through a hole into a sort of a back cave, and the, the back cave, not a bat cave, in case you were I thought you were thinking, where's Batman <laughs> coming from? Yeah, right yeah. So, um, yes, and they, they, they build it there. So, a ritualistic behavior because of all the bone sizes and, and, and the like. Yeah, and they're, they're very specific. Uh, don't know why, but they were doing something deliberate there. So yes. we consider, and with archaeologists, if they see something that looks deliberate, but they can't work out what it is, they often call it ritual. So there we have ritual. And if something's ritualized, we often then associate it with religion. So it okay. may be completely wrong. You know, they may have just been randomly throwing and broken bones there, and they were just coincidentally broke them all to the same size. Okay. Is there an argument to be made that when Homo sapiens left Africa, they may not necessarily have had a religion when they left uh, until they reached the mainland of Eurasia? Is that possible that they met the Neanderthals and then from them and engaging with them, they started to pick up these ideas of religion? No, as I say, not. And that's because we feel very probabilistically that myths, certain myths came from Africa, such as the dragon myth, and creation myths and the myth of death and immortality. And if they came from Africa as myths, myths tend to inform religion. Okay, so I'll go with that. So probably some religious thinking going on. And uh, I don't think I've got it on this tree, so that's something to add. What is the evidence for there being uh, a myth in Africa at around about 130,000 BCE? Right, so what we know is that so the, i think it was the hoy who first mentioned it so he was looking at the creation myth um and he was probably looking at work done by witzel so witzel uh, is a harvard or was a harvard professor who's retired now um though he's still involved he wrote the book of world mythology the, um that's like my Something bible book i got it i got okay. it just behind me yeah so he, and he talks about he talks about um the sacrifice of the giant has been all over the world such as mesoamerica as well as here he's in europe uh, but he also talks about the earth diver myth and, and earlier myths and the hoy in effect tried to take that back further and felt and it may be even witted as well felt that because it's got to come out at least when humans left africa for it to disperse so whilst we know humans left Africa before 70,000 years ago, the 70,000 year dispersal is the one 
that spread the DNA across the world. Mm, mm. Okay, so we know they must have had that myth then, but because of how humans evolved, we believe that myth is probably much older. Mm -hmm. And and so we you know we think it's about one hundred thirty thousand years is is sort of the the form where we see the culture that left Africa, you know, in a in a in a recognisable form in the okay. middle of Africa. So th that's the thinking. There's no evidence. Mm. It's just probably if we had a scale of probability, it wouldn't be so improbable as to not be considered. How would I represent that on the tree, though? Because it sounds like it's a reconstruction, a reconstruction of uh, myths. So it sounds like to get there, you have to use um, theories and so on. It's not necessarily like there's evidence, well, is there? Nothing objective. You've got the tree I can use. So, so the the early myth is the people come from the underground uh, mm -hmm. and onto land, and that's linked to the dragon myth and the tree of life. So, if we know these myths are happening pre seventy thousand years ago in Africa, then you you, know, you could theoretically reconstruct a very basic cosmogony for those early people based on, yeah, because you know what what they thought about life, what they thought about death, and now they thought about the creation of the world. Mm -hmm. So, and they so we don't know really the religion around that. I mean, they were probably animistic, uh, so thinking everything had life, like a life force within it, That's yeah, right, anything yeah. that moved. So there'd be a combination of that myth with that thinking that made their, which you could call a religion. Okay, so what I could do, if I just pop in back here, I could... Um, just say something. I could add it right at the base of the tree where I said animism. I could I could possibly put a little uh, cosmological shape there and you could click on it and then people could then go inside and say this is a, a possible reconstruction of the earliest myth ever told. That would, that would work, wouldn't it? Or just another icon saying mythology. So animism is different to the mythologies, you could just say they're also telling stories. So that yeah. they were building, although they weren't really making objects back then, um, it's all nothing significant, it was all jewellery. Uh, but if you cling that with animism and then with mythology, those three bits together, you get a good representation of the culture, culture's thinking. Mm. Mm. I've got a quick question again to ask, because I think people will always be getting very confused about religion and mythology. If uh, people refer to Greek myths as just stories, they think of it as mythology. But if you lived, say, 800 to 2000 BCE and you were in Greece, it wouldn't have been a mythology at the time. It would have been a religion to them, wouldn't it? Well, OK, so you have to understand what mythology is in an academic sense. So um, mythology tends to be a story that has a truth in it, a sacred truth, and it tends to have a god in there. So for because the story has a god in it, so there's many gods in the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, therefore you can consider it a religious story. Mm -hmm. I mean, because don't forget their religion. So most, when people think of religion, many people default to Abra an Abrahamic religion, certainly in, in Europe and, and, and the Americas. That's the, you're just used to have, that's how we see religion. Like we all go to church and that isn't how religion tended to work in the rest of the world before yeah, Christianity was made up. So, yeah, it, it, from that point of view, it was a book that described the religion and described how things happened. And it, but the thing is, we because we have no definite history of Greece before the first Olympic Games, so we don't exactly know when anything happened before the Olympic Games, but we know when the first Olympic Games were and therefore can place things in history after that. Anything before that is considered mythology because it is prehistory. Okay, okay. As well, so so considering those things all together, that's how we call it mythology and why we think it's linked to religion because it has God in. So as we'll get to later, um, that would be part of an agricultural religion mythology um, in from the Indo-Europeans, isn't it? For, with, in terms of Greek mythology and Norse mythology and Germanic it mythology. A, uh, it was a mix. So Greece, Greece is a real, real mix of, yeah, yeah. of cultures. So their creation myth is very Near East influenced. Um, mm -hmm. And we see that. So um, I've I'm shown examples myself on my YouTube channel where we can see how the Near East myth goes from the... Apsu and Tiamat myth of the Enumit Lish in Babylon or Samaria, and then basically evolves slightly and ends up in Greece. And it's just, I'll, 
I'll put a link to that video actually on this one so people can have a look at it because it'll be worth checking out. Okay. All right, let's do let's start working up the branch then. So I'm going to bring the infographic back up. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to leave Africa, which is just here from this branch. And when it goes yellow, we're heading into the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And I've got uh, another Neanderthal burial site here. So we've got signs of um, so ancestor it. worship, uh, in, I would in say. What, what's near Israel uh, today? Uh, and we, the reason you've gone there is because that's the natural migration path. If you come out of Africa, people yeah. weren't sailing boats, so they went up around the Mediterranean. And yes, yeah, so but there's a cave at least one cave, there may be a couple of caves where we find... I've got another one just here, the, the Shanidar burial yeah, site as well. exactly. Uh, and some of those have Homo sapiens in as well, I believe. And um, the problem is we don't really know what's going on. We think they're burials, again, if, it, if someone's stuck in the ground with a rock on them, we think, oh, they must be buried. But they're in a cave and it could be that the rocks fell on them. And there's mm. one really good example, of, and Alice Roberts... So Professor Alex Roberts talks about this in her book, uh, Ancestors, I think it is, uh, where we actually see people thought someone was buried with flowers in the cave. It That's turns, right, I remember that. It, it turns out that gerbils love burying <laughs> uh, to dead bodies in the ground. And it could be that the gerbils have taken pollen seeds into their oh, burrows okay. Okay. Right by the body, and that's how we get the pollen by the body. So there, there's enough doubt to say we're not 100% sure they are all burials, deliberate burials. Okay. But if the one of them is we're unsure about, but the other one seems to be quite concrete, again, you could sort of say, well, they're at the same time period, so it would be... They're roughly the same time. Yeah, it, yeah, feels, it, would... it feels right that at least some of them would be deliberate burials. It's a funny... I've heard you say the word feel twice. It's, it's a funny thing because it's true, isn't it? There's a, There's a point where as Ben Shapiro says, facts don't care about your feelings, John. Mm. We would stick with the facts. But when you put it all together, you start to get this intuition, don't you? There's this feel where you go, well, when it's you look at it all... at the end of the yeah. day. I can talk statistics to you, but it's... Yeah, I'm, I, I use the word feel rather than say, oh, it's about 50-50 chance. Yeah. I mean, I, from, as a, I'm coming at this... I know it's weird. I'm a writer who's going into history and developing a, a historical infographic for religion. But I do... I, I, a lot of this is to help me get intuitive with some of the creative work I'm doing later on. So uh, that's my, yeah. When you say the word feel, I'm like, yes, I'm, I'm with you. I feel this. <laughs> the force is strong <laughs> in this one. Right. So now we're going to go from the Middle East. We're going to cross over into Europe. So this is around about 40,000 BCE, but although I don't actually start getting much evidence yeah. until 35,000 BCE. Well, it's about 35 to 40,000. And yeah. so the next bit of evidence is fascinating. It's fascinating okay. for a number of reasons. One, what happened for 25,000 years? Yes. You know, and it's only recently that we found evidence for Homo sapiens in Europe from, mm -hmm. you know, like very, it's like 5,000 years after those burials. So it's like, really, where did they go? What, what was happening to them? Uh, but the, the first object we find is the Lion Man. And the Lion Man is amazing because it's the first indication we have of uh, a humanoid sculpture but not only that it is also the first representation we know of that humans made of an imaginary object so someone's thought of an object in their head that doesn't exist and has built that object and that's the first time that's ever happened so we also see it as a key or potentially a key evolutionary moment in how the brain was working because before then, the only things we really made were flints and jewellery and, and weapons. There was actually no other objects made. So something happened around this time to allow someone to have the time to make that, to think of it and create it. It's, um, yeah, hmm. very interesting. It's, it's, so it's an anthropomorphic being. It's not even a representation of a person. It's it's a half lion, half man. I have to man. show you it. You can have a picture, but I can actually oh, show you I've got you one, funnily enough, and I didn't plan yeah. this, but I've actually got one here. It's, it's, uh, okay. I got it from a, a museum. Let's see if I can get it to the camera. There is my... Okay. There he is. I was out of focus, but... Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. That's, that's my camera is a bit. That's uh, the new. That's the new creation because he went through a number of remodelings where they tried to work out how he was built. So the oh, arm right. arm okay. was, had one arm, and then I think it was right. nine. Oh, was it 2003? I can't remember the other day. Built it again. It was two arms. 
Okay, so th- we've got Venus figurines as well appearing. They, they start appearing in the same location. Rough, yeah, around the same area. There's a couple of valleys and within you know, 50 miles, you'll be suddenly see a plethora of these figurines. So what's going on? Well, Why? Why did this happen? It's a, well, part of it psychological, I think, in the sense that if you see, like, your caveman neighbour have this wonderful item, you want to create wonderful items. But, you know, you, I, I mean, you, we could laugh about it, but if the caveman's mate says, well, you know, I, I want you to make car of me rather than the lion perhaps that's why we create a venus figure because at the end of the day we don't really understand what those venus figures actually relate to we believe they're some form of religious sort of icon but they could equally be as a model of the the, the wife or the, the equivalent of the wife in in that age it could be some even indicated could even be a, a sexual object like a sex toy of kinds i've heard that yeah some so, people are saying it has a pornographic sort of um well and some of them I, do yeah concept behind it i so again i, I guess we're working on an intuition feeling and just having a you're using our imagination but um we've got venus figurines we've got a lion man we've got handprints and caves and we get all this art of of hunting and so on uh, so they they are at least the very least we're understanding what was important to them and th- yeah we understand that the female form and uh, I mean I don't want to look at it sexually necessarily because I do think it is based on fertility the large breasts and the large hips it makes sense who it was yeah it does doesn't it and um, that the the hunting obviously vitally important to the the survival of a tribe the more the more meat the more the more food you get the more the more leather and fur, the more likely your tribe's going to survive, especially when the there's a... Are we, are we in the middle of an ice age here or is it starting to recede uh, the, a bit? Fifth, fifth, uh, so, so there was an ice age, uh, so how do you, an ice age around 20,000 years ago, then it stopped and then it came back about 12,000 because of the younger dryers. So it was a reasonably warm period, some of that. And what we find, we, we, what, have you got that cave? Have you got cave art there? So the cave art is quite interesting. So we now believe much cave art isn't religious focused. Oh right, we okay. Really, the cave art is actually documentation of herding and mating of animals to allow better hunting. Hmm. Um, what about the handprints? We see lots of handprints, and sometimes they may well you see. Be, yeah, there may just be memories. What is what is interesting is it. it some academics believe much of the painting was done by children or by All females. Right. Is that because of the size sure. of the hands? Size of the hands may do that, yeah, and how the hands are. So, hmm. That's, okay, that's so also an interesting... one thing I'll bring up, I, I mean, I, I want to stick to the European branch, but I do want to bring mm-hmm. something up. I've got a feeling today, by the way, I think we're going to get probably to the... Um, I think we'll get to the agricultural age. We might have to finish and do the rest another time because I think our time is a bit limited. But if I zoom back out on the infographic... Um, it is interesting studying the Aboriginal people because they mm-hmm. they have the dream time, don't they? And they they talk they about the kangaroo people, the um, the koala bear people, and the coyote people or the Tasmanian people. So they 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 see themselves as uh, an extension of animals in the distant past that have then become people, and they believe that they, their spirit is attached to that tribe, and. What's interesting there is if you study that culture, you, it, it is like a, a fossil, isn't it, of a, survi- a living fossil of what our ancestors yes. were thinking possibly a long time ago. So, I mean, I, I don't think we can necessarily say that in Europe well, they would we have can. had the same. Well, sort of. So what we can say, for people who don't know, is that uh, the First Nation Australians are, are direct descendants of the 70,000-year uh, migration or dispersal out of Africa um, like some some of the homo sapiens that left Africa literally went straight to Australia so they are a good example there but what's quite interesting when we talk about the lion man is that some believe because we see this sort of imagination happening it's the time when humans started to realise they weren't just another animal which is what you're sort of indicating there with the Aborigines that they were different which means they start having, they'll start understanding their consciousness, mm-hmm. and therefore that would infer that they were starting to have what we would consider religious thought at that time. 
I, I mean, I've got a very strong imagination, John, so you have to watch out for me. But I do think about these things sometimes. Like, why would we, why did we start doing, making these anthropomorphic sort of statues of lion mm. men? And, and why did we refer to ourselves in, in Australia as the people of the kangaroo and so on? It's like, what, how are they doing this? And also another thing, later on in, in Greek mythology, Zeus, which was like, he was associated with the eagle and the bull, you know, the most powerful animals on the, the sky. Was, was he associated with the bull, Zeus? Not uh, well, not, ne not necessarily. I mean, the cattle were, was a big thing, though, in yeah. the European. But obviously, with the eagle, he was, and it was the, so. In terms of the sky, he was like, "Well, I I will be associated with the most powerful bird in the sky. It's going to be the mm -hmm. eagle, the king of the birds. And I, therefore, if I'm going to have a totem animal, it will be the king of the bird exactly. kingdom." And I was thinking about would our ancestors, with that mindset, if we take that back in time even further, would they have? as they were moving into Europe, noticed that the animal that was surviving, that was the the, the pr alpha male, the alpha predator, sorry, would be a wolf and a bear and cave lion. Cave lion. So wouldn't cave they lion. then, wouldn't they see, look, that, that they, the, the lion is going off and killing these other animals. And if I copy that animal, do what that animal's doing, I can survive. Because if that animal can survive here and I copy that animal, I can survive here. So that we were mimicking, you know, and I think we're, I think mm -hmm. as apes, we're very good at that, aren't we? We're very good yeah. at mimicking other creatures uh, to the point where we can mimic their sounds. You know, I, I don't think a lion can mimic an ape, but an, an ape can mimic a lion. So I think that we were able to sort of say, well, I, I want to be like the lion because I can survive here. And maybe that would have created a slightly warrior cast of a tribe, perhaps if they became very heavy on the hunting and the spirits. So again, I'm using my imagination, I know. But then you might have somebody else who goes, well, the herd, have you noticed that the herds do very well? Even though they're being picked off by the lions, they work in numbers and they have larger families than the, than the wolves and the lions. And if you want a large family, maybe we should be like the herd. Yeah, cause and effect, I think you may get in the wrong way around. We, we had as many children as we could have. <laughs> I don't think there's that thing, but I do think the cave paintings may give a clue to what you're saying. So mm. it's all, it always puzzled me. Why did we paint pictures of things like lions, like the predators, on the walls of the cave? Mm. Now, I can understand that's painting pictures of the animals you want to eat and then associating them with uh, like lunar cycles and things like that, which is what we mm. believe was happening. But why lions? And then is that because we were hoping to, to I knew originally my first thoughts when I saw cave paintings were that we were trying to envisage, envision ourselves being that animal. Mm. You know, we wanted to be as fast as a horse or as you know, strong yeah. as a lion. Yeah. yeah and, that, and that's why that was there, but it, that isn't necessarily the case. Um, and then what we also see is there may actually be mythology linked to that. So De Hoy, again, he, he talks of a myth where paintings come alive. It's quite a common myth in more modern times that someone sculpts something and, and a beautiful woman and a beautiful woman comes alive because he wished it for that to happen in a dream or mm. wished to God. Well, we actually believe that kind of motif was applicable to cave paintings, mm. to certainly some of the cave paintings we see. So... You we see cave paintings of wild animals actually have arrows painted in the what looks like of like V signs in the in, in the hope that it would kill them if they came alive. Mm. That's how we, we sort of perceive that. So what's that? Oh, I, I don't <laughs> really know, but I'm just saying these are the the options out there to help with that thinking you're having. You know, yeah, it's the reconstruction, is it? We're trying yeah. to get into the mind of the ancestors, and it does help when you find people alive today where you can sort of study. Uh, from an anthropological point of view, tribes still with us today where we can, it's amazing because you can actually try and get into the mind mm. of people the that mindset. possibly, yeah. So anyway, let's move up mm -hmm. the tree. I want, I need to move up the Stone Age because we've got to, to go to the next era. So if I go back to the infographic. Right, so uh, it stays like that for a long time, doesn't it? This sort of uh, Venus figurines, they keep appearing consistently uh, for thousands of years, yes, I believe. Yes, so, so the Venus figurines start dying out when humans start making uh, communal places to live, places that are, are permanent settlements. Yeah, which uh, takes us nicely to Gebleki Tepe, which I've put in the middle of the biggest branch uh, on the entire okay. tree. You can see I've got lots of major branches mm -hmm. everywhere. The reason I did that is because it's, well, archaeologically, it's a very significant site because it's the it first is. megalithic structure we've ever made. That I, I think, I, mean, I don't think there's anything before that, is there? There is. 
Uh, oh, sorry. Yes, yeah. Another Gablecki, isn't it? There's a more more tepes. Yep. Uh, and we know we know we were building stone houses about fifteen, sixteen thousand years ago. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is all happening. Yeah, definitely, definitely. There, there's, okay. And they, and so communities are being built, and so we move away from animism and start thinking about gods. And I think that's what happens is if you're in a community, your thinking changes as to if you're in the wild in the nature. Hmm. And so your gods become more like what you want them to be, which is other people. And so they become personified, which is why I don't think Venus figures are necessarily goddesses because you didn't think about that personification mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. that of, of a god. So they might represent something else. Okay. So how uh, how good are you on the Gablecki Tepe sort of period? Is that absolutely that rubbish? <laughs> uh, okay. my, I mean, I've, I've read a lot, but I wouldn't want to answer any academic questions about it it was uh, from what i read it was still it wasn't necessarily uh agricultural quite at this point but although it was starting to go that way it was very much a hunting sort of uh when you study the the, the rock still art. hunter gathering going on so yeah. well, what, so pe- people need to understand how farming works so we didn't just suddenly one day say oh we're going to stop hunter gathering and we go farming what we started to do is we started to eat grasses about twenty thousand years ago and then as time went on, we, we initially had just a, a, like a little bit of grass, but as time went on, we started to cultivate grass. So by 15,000 years ago, maybe 10, 15% of the grasses we ate were cultivated, like oh, we knew with the, where they were growing. And so by 10,000 uh, or, or, or 12,000 years ago, so Glebeki Tep, maybe 50% of the grasses we were eating were being farmed. And certainly by 10,000 years ago, 8,000 BCE, yeah, you know, it was a good eighty percent of the ninety percent of the grasses, and that's when you know farming really took off. And when we see dispersals from the Near East go to other parts of the world, certainly into Europe and mm. Greece and the northern Mediterranean. So that was yeah, that would be a major incident in human history. Um, and then I've got mm. a branch coming off in both directions: one going into the Middle East and one going into Europe. So we'll we'll stick with Europe for now, but. Mm-hmm. Um, We've got a, a, a still a fertility symbol here by the look of it. There's um, the, the. Are you familiar with the Lipinski verse sim, um, symbol? Is that the totem? That yeah, it's got totem, um, yeah, the Slavic. Uh, I think it was nine thousand five hundred BCE. Yes. So still, yeah, still a bit of fertility symbolism going on, and same here. Uh, that's interesting. Well, in the Bagara th- cave. Yeah, the, the weird thing about the the totem, not weird. Many of the things made were wood. So that's right. Just aren't records of them. So yeah, yeah. it may be that they were wooden totems going back 50,000 years. Yeah, yeah. So I've always thought the same thing. There's the uh, Shigir idol, 9,500 BCE, made of wood, preserved amazingly. Was it in a peat bog? Yes, yes, most of them would be. Which is very rare. But yeah, I thought the same thing. I was like, well, if that was there, we could go back 20,000 BC, 50,000 BC. So mm. I completely agree with that. Um, another interesting observation I've got here is the... A feminine figure potentially it could be masculine but it's got its arms raised in the air that becomes a common symbol doesn't it so that's the magara cave i, I think it's spain i'll have to look into that um 8000 bce and if we go up here we see it appearing again in ancient egypt and then i think it appears again in a couple of, oh, here we are in the minoan period it's just strange the, the raised arms in the air the berber people have the same thing so it seems to be a common motif well, that appears yeah so this is where we need to actually think about how many poses do humans really have? They have hands next to them or hands in the air. Have you seen There's the Kama two. Sutra? Have you read the Kama Sutra? Oh, well, I've, <laughs> I've looked at the pictures. There's many, so, pi- many, fo- many poses, mate. Many poses. Many poses. <laughs> but I mean, as, as a sculpting, as designing, you, there's basically two stances a person has. So I wouldn't read too much into the fact that there's a common stance because otherwise you say well look all these people got their hands next to their their sides and everywhere and people have tried to say that with oh no look these people have got four fingers and like there's there's this neck thing like necklace and you'll see like the becky tepe and um maoris and easter island and things they say oh they've all got this common mm, mm. look and it's like you'll carry a bag i've seen that appearing a lot well, i think in... so that but, but it's like well humans have yeah if you look at how we sh- how hands are it's, it isn't necessarily that surprising, you know, because people want to link it back. Oh, there was just one, you know, one 
we'll do a Graham Hancock thing here, one ancient culture that there's no trace of that went around the world and put these ideas in everybody's head. But that isn't, to me, that's not a very probable cause of why we see that. It's just well, I, I'd like to push back on that a little bit. I'd like to push back because I've yes, done yes. a bit of sculpting myself. And okay. um, some 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 poses, uh, the, the, if you're carving, I mean, I've carved a soft, uh, soft stone and it breaks easily when you do the arms raised in the air and things like that. It's, mm -hmm. it's so annoying. It just breaks so easily. So it's actually quite an annoying pose to do. Um, so when it's all one block and you carve the shape of the arms into it, that's so easy. It's mu much easier to do something like that. Exactly, yeah. So, but there's with the, once you've got your arms out, you've got so many different planes to move them and you can have your arms forward with the hands out like this, for instance. Um, you can have the hands of cradling the face. Uh, you can have the, you can have the arms just out straight. There's, I, I can think of a myriad of symbols, but that is just interesting. That one s seems to appear in Europe and Africa and the, you know, well, all the areas that are related. But the arms so. at the right, exactly the same angles and the elbows bent exactly the same way. I would say no, uh, I I no. would I would argue that it's enough Doc, to be compelling. Your, consider your recent argument about how arms could be in different places. Now that they are exactly the same, or they're, they're different. I, I okay. Say, uh, I I I am yet to be convinced of that. I just think that is just a natural human perception of how to draw something. It's like we see um, we, we see graffiti from young children from two or three thousand years ago like in, in, in roman um like carvings and things like that which show adults as a big sort of smiley face with big hands like stick yes. figures yeah and you go to a nursery school today and what do kids draw exactly the same thing hmm. there's just a natural human perception of how well, also, yeah, I, I, yeah, and we, we do kids copy each other when they, and a certain you know, form takes off and you see them copying yeah. the, the same pictures and so on, learning off each other doing that, which is, a, I guess, another reason, yeah, why they, they could follow similar patterns is simply because they're just copying each other and they didn't think about, nobody nobody thought mm. about doing the hand in front. Doing yeah, if someone <laughs> saw that, then because don't forget people were traveling around. I mean, humans didn't stay still. They migrated a lot. So if someone had a a carving of a woman with her hands in the air and someone said oh that looks really good that's mm, a nice mm. new post let me make one of those mm. Mm. i'd be interested it's a shame we haven't got the i i would love to see the wooden sculptures they must have made and i'm sure they must have done it but uh just just to think all this art that's been lost in time such a shame mm -hmm. uh right so uh coming back out again i think we've got time to just about move into the agricultural age so let's come back out okay so that i've written down this is neolithic europe so we know it's the mm -hmm. agricultural age Yep. And we've got a lot of pottery appearing as well. So we've got uh, the comb ceramic culture, the Urtebol culture. And then, interestingly, we, with the pottery and the figurines, we start getting more megaliths. And it really starts to kick yeah. off, doesn't it, in, in Europe with um, mm -hmm. Karnak stones, Newgrange, Stonehenge, the Antiquira megalithic site in, in Portugal, I believe. Mm -hmm. w what's happening here? Why have we suddenly moved? I mean, obviously... It's interesting because Gebleki Tepe is so ancient. We're looking back at 10,000 BCE, but I haven't found much evidence for other megalithic sites except for the, the Nabta Player, um, which is... Could you okay. talk a little bit about the Nabta Player site? Uh, the Nabta Player, that's the earliest... Well, that's the earliest stone circle we know of, I believe. Mm. And it's meant to be representative of a calendar and it's found in Nabta Player in Egypt, which looks like a desert. But actually, when that was made... It was a lush mm. green field and pasture. Right. So we may believe it has some agricultural reference in there because agriculture was happening at the time in that area. So that's possibly where that, that is sense. coming that from. That really makes sense. It's it's so this is going to be a common theme that starts to develop, isn't it? That the the megalithic sites are a part of us marking how the cycle of agriculture works. So almost certainly. I mean, some people call it a calendar. I mean, it isn't it isn't a, a strict calendar, I guess, mm -hmm. but it also represents something else as well, which we'll talk about in a minute. Okay. Um, the, other, the other thing we need to know about the pottery, which you mentioned, is that because uh, I talk about how archaeologists call things rituals when they don't understand them, mm. um, what we do is we label cultures by the pottery they make and the patterns on the pottery yeah, because yeah. there isn't really anything else there we can use to label them. So it's... it's we do have to be careful when we say someone's like the Calded Ware peoples. We assume because they had the same kind of pottery, they all believe the same kind of thing. 
mm-hmm. but that is a really broad brush to, to yeah. throw across them. So we, we should be more nuanced if we wanted to really understand what's going on there. And you get in some of these sites, although I've shown a picture of pottery, sometimes you get these little figurines of a horse or, again, there's a little a little man there. It could be a toy for a kid. We just don't know, do we? It could be um, a votive offering. Yeah, you, get, you get a lot of those starting to happen. So what we're finding here, so you say there's a long period of time between Glebeki Tep at 10,000 years and, let's say, some of the megaliths, which are sort of 7,000 years old. So old, like, Yeah. Tw- 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 well, there isn't. Well, there is, but what you find is that it took the Near Eastern people quite some time to get into Europe. Mm-hmm. So they, 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 they travelled it to Greece, and they were there in Greece by about eight and a half thousand years ago. Okay, so 6,500 BCE. And then it literally took them another thousand years to work out, oh, my God, what are these mountains and trees and fields here? Because that doesn't mm-hmm. look like home at all. Home is, is lots of clay and stone and... Yeah, and, and, and sort of grassland. And we do, there's a whole, so it literally took them a thousand years, fifteen hundred years, to, of staying still in Greece before they actually went into Europe, which would then coincide with when we start seeing, oh well, there's all these stones here. Now, why are they building stone circles? That's interesting. So one, I think, is a it helps with keeping track of time in the calendar and the seasons, mm-hmm. but I also think it also informs certain beliefs. So, you know, this is a sense of, I mean, you, you had stone huts in um, the Near East, but when you get into the, like the Germanic area and the, and the middle of Europe, they're having to build houses from wood uh, and they have to make clear, they have to clear forests um, to plant crops and they probably have to clear stones and someone's probably thinking, well, what do we do with these stones and this wood? And the wood, we, you know, so the earliest hinges are built from wooden poles and then that, that then changes into stones and the stones, as I say, can inform calendar because uh, people would have seen these stones and see how the shadows change through time and then they start associating certain times of the year with, with certain things. And so whilst most people go to Stonehenge and celebrate the summer solstice because it's the longest day of the year, it's almost certain that biggest festival or feast going on at Stonehenge because there were feasts there is actually the winter solstice where night was the longest because mm. that's when you were close to your ancestors and the dead and we got many many stories that then come about you know the, the longest night and being close to the dead and all the things that happen you know eventually Halloween springs up mm. you know, from sort of Christian influenced Celtic yeah, you know, it's hard to see exactly how it happened, but I think the clearing of the forest, all this wood, the clearing of the fields and the stones that come up, you know, what people did things with the spare wood and stone, I, I, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. Just just out of interest then, what, what kind of religion are we looking at here? So this is, can we can we say confidently that it's polytheistic at this point now? That no, we've yeah, got... so there'd be near, this would be, in effect, a... a an evolution or a, a, a sort of a, a corruption of the Near Eastern religion. So, so there, there will be a pantheon of gods and personified gods, so gods as people in there at that point. But we we would likely have the agricultural myths as well, wouldn't we? Which is going to be there, things there like be the agricultural myths. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you give us a flavour of that? Just give, give us a little broad so, overview. So the of... agricultural myth is is you tend to start the world of a chaotic void an ocean a chaotic ocean uh, and then a number of gods come along and and they have wives and children and the children kill the father and sleep with the the mother to have a daughter who then they sleep with to have another child who then kills that um, male and, and you get, get this whole family feud i call it going on for a few generations which sort of establishes a a sort of a heritage for the divinity that does remain and so we see that, and we see various acts of, of that going on, the mutilation, and the mutilation often happens with a sickle, which is again yes. is a real nod to agricultural people. Um, yeah, and, and, yeah, and then there's various stories about how the outcast male then tries to come back, and then it, it doesn't work, and success happens. But there's, there's a lot of castration in there, and, yeah, and a lot of incest, 
a matricide and patricide. Would we have a, a, a god or goddess going into the underworld at this point, where yes, as, they, yes. as they as they are taken away, the the land on the surface withers and dies, and then somebody has to come down to get them back, which yeah, then so creates the that. cycle. Definitely, definitely, we get that. Yeah, so you get, you have people who are familiar with Venana and Ishtar, and you get those myths exist. You know, we get them with Persephone, we get them uh, even in Nordic culture with Baldur. You know, he is. They're, they're all examples of agricultural gods or gods that have been linked with agricultural myth you know, because of the season so that's definitely going on okay i've noticed um when i was reading uh myths earlier on uh when i f- first started doing this project i noticed a huge similarity between the osiris and uh, isis myth and mm-hmm. persephone and yes because uh, demeter the same yeah yeah to the point even where there was there was this point in both stories where they ended up in another kingdom and they ended up burning a child to make that child immortal. But then the the parents of that child, when they saw the ritual being done, they were so horrified, they stopped the ritual. Mm. And then the, the goddess would say, what have you done? I was about to make this child immortal. Is that, do you know much about that myth? And it, is it attached to this agricultural myth? Yeah, that's, that's definitely an agricultural myth. And yeah, the, the evolution is, is clear. So when I talk about the... Near Eastern creation myth and how it evolves. Yeah, the the other myths would have come along with it, including the underworld myth. And um, yeah, that, that's a really common myth. And the underworld myth is a nod to agriculture and an understanding of seasons and the cycle in the seasons. And so in Egy- Egypt, it's kept with uh, the brother and sister, it's Dumazid and um, I can't mm. remember his sister's name. Uh, but you don't always get it. Sometimes you just get one person to go in the underworld for a period of time. And in some myths, you get one person going around the world permanently so mm. it, you know, it, it does change but that myth is already there that season's there and that is why you get the winter solstice being close to death as the most yeah. important of the festivals and you know where we start seeing bodies buried in stone tombs and things like that mm. and, right. you know, that's, fascinating yeah and going back to tombs, uh, again, megalithic culture, they're abundant, aren't they? We start building lots of stone tombs. Who are these for? Who are we building these huge megalithic tombs? What are they called? Um, okay. a, ki- a kind of, it's the one with the three, the three stones underneath and a capstone on top. Yeah, yeah. So, so they're, 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 they're the sort of the last of the agricultural peoples building that. And, and you'll find things simplify. So you, all the time you see religion get simplified because no one can really be bothered to do the ritual. So as, as, as we get nearer to the current day, rituals get simplified. So, you know, we used to sacrifice hundreds of cattle and even people mm. and slowly you're sacrificing goats, then just chickens, then just a little object. And you know, now, now you go to church and say, please forgive me. And all your sins have gone. You know, you don't have to sacrifice anything. So, <laughs> You sound yeah, almost like you, we, should, we should go back to the old days. You know, we put more effort into it back then. We <laughs> slaughtered a thousand well, if, sheep. If you want to believe in a, in a god, then you know, believe in a god. Yeah, well, yeah that's yeah, fair do, enough. Do that's a, properly. Um, it'd be more impressive, I guess. Okay. Exactly. So, yeah. It, it's, so, and so you see stone circles slowly get you know, simpler and simpler mm. and you know, stop being maintained. And in effect they too then generate myth because you know you like mythology yes and i see that the the change because there's a rapid change in culture so the indo-europeans start turning up mm. around 4000 bc oh, I, I, we'll, we'll finish on them actually if that's okay, okay. But yes they were just about well, here, and when they, they turn yeah. up you get this culture change and people then wonder who built those stone circles uh, the, the indo-europeans then give the plague to all the agricultural people who've never really handled animals before and half of them die out in europe you know, Europeans come in, and that starts the next wave of your chart. But yeah, so we've got there all these Stonehenge sort of megalithic areas here. But just cutting across sideways, four thousand five hundred BCE. This is your specialist subject. The Proto-Indo-Europeans yep. begin to emerge. Uh, well, the Indo-Europeans emerge. They're not Proto. Proto is oh. the language they speak. Right. Okay. The Indo-European people. My question is. What um what distinguishes these people because they they go on to really change the the yes. cultural sort of dynamic of Europe, don't they? they do. Who are they and what kind of religion were they practicing and what did they do to change the rest of the the social religious landscape? Well, okay, so big question. So when the Near East people, the agricultural people, came into Europe, they came as families 
and they settled down in communities and there was enough diversity in the number of people there that they could happily grow as culture. Okay. So when the Indo-Europeans then um, turn up, they're very patriarchal. And so what happens is that when the father of the family dies, the eldest son takes over the father's land and the other children, the other males have to leave. And they basically went to warrior school, for want of a better word. They joined like a warrior cult and learned how to fight. And eventually some of these would travel into Europe. But there is just a band of males. They're not going to get anything done. So what do they have to do? They have to take women from the local culture. So they take hunter-gatherer women and they take agricultural women and made for them. And that causes a, a real merging of myth and culture and DNA. We've got lots of DNA evidence mm. to show that anybody of European heritage has a combination of early European farmer, Indo-European and hunter-gatherer DNA within them. So that's a that's a dark side, isn't it, to the history of uh, the Indo-Europeans mm -hmm. because there's uh, a, a rate of, it's, within the culture is the actual rape and pillaging and well, 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 well they say so it's just males turning up. So mm. what does but you know they have to survive, and so that's how they survived. Right, and it, so they didn't seduce the women and, and be nice and it's, give them flowers. Uh, they just took them and well, not, it, not there was a, there was a sense of. Yeah, not, not the first group. You know, once they had communities settled, there was probably, you know, it's far more civilised. You know, they were, you know, the, the, there's, it's noted within uh, culture, certainly in Germanic culture, that they were very much monogamous. Uh, they, they, they were very, yeah, mm. if you're married to your wife, you're married to your wife. You don't mess around. So there are some, you know, underlying things there that once you had a woman, you were, you know, loyal to that woman and looked after them and had the family when you watch documentaries i've been watching um on netflix there's a a, a a documentary at the moment about chimps okay and and you see different tribes within the, the chimp community doing just that stealing children uh stealing women um eating eating other children if it's not from their mm -hmm. tribe and they're like well i'm going to eat that one so you you do see this it's i think sometimes people think that uh oh the men, men are horrible and so on but it's it's just a, it's been in the dna of of hominids for god knows how long um, you need to survive and you need to breed yeah they, so, they are the two drivers of life survive and breed but uh yeah obviously we live in a, a day and age where I, would you argue that we live in a day and age where this has gone because of religion? Would you say that, it, that the evolution of religion over thousands and thousands of years pushed back against the, the, the darker side of our instincts and our nature? It's and, just civilization. Would, you, what, yes. Would, but sorry, would you, sorry, would you sorry. If you were to narrow it down, because civilizations and cultures well, So would huge. I say the Roman Catholic Church who hired pedophile priests within the Vatican, are they doing a, a good job at making the world a better place? Like that. So no, no. <laughs> but sorry, that was a we... bit of a bias. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we could. I've I've been watching Ray Donovan recently, and it's uh, <laughs> that, that that whole subject's completely embedded in that entire storyline. But um, that it's it's. I mean, we, you could call that the low hanging fruit, is it? It's easy to go for those really horrible aspects of religion. But could we argue on the whole? That it was, it was uh, as over time, many religions, not all of them, of course, but many religions, especially I would say in the sort of axial era, started f focusing on peace and kindness and love and uh, loving your neighbour and so on. And it just seemed that I don't, I don't necessarily think those no. are things I read in the older. Sort the the of church, religion. you know, Charlemagne committed genocide in the, in the name of Christianity to yes. convert people convert or die i wouldn't necessarily say that was progress compared to just turn up and we need somewhere to live and somewhere where, to where do with. you think we got our moral our moral ethical sort of eth background that made us i would argue now more civilized better people would Gun you say powder. it was more you think it was the, okay explain that <laughs> unpack that one for me okay so the, the, so, the threat of so the gun you know, the, the 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 it's like the nuclear deterrent why, why hasn't there been a world war since nuclear bomb yeah that's a good point that's a good point yeah yeah so that he with the biggest gun can force peace comes on a point, yeah the, the, yeah the, when the gun's so big you don't want to be shot okay 
So, so would you argue then? I mean, I'm going to be talking to lots of different people, and I might put you on the extreme end of the spectrum. But would you argue? Would you argue then that religion doesn't necessarily bring a, a, a moral, ethical guidance for people that 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 softens our nature and makes us more agreeable with one another? Would you say that maybe it didn't achieve that in, in so, its lifetime? Right, so let, let me be very fair here. There are a majority of individuals who are religious who are very good people absolutely however it is the organization of you know, the religious organizations and the political powers that relied on the power of the religious organization that were very corrupt i mean okay, you could so argue the power power is the problem which goes back to the gun being the problem you could say that actually the guns being the biggest problem i mean yes nukes have kind of created proxy wars rather than world wars but you could argue that that's the, the problem is still that we have the gun we still have this as an issue you don't think that religion could get us out of this that religion has a way to lead us back to being more loving caring ethical don't people need religion for that no in fact in fact you know i would argue there's you know is it people of religion who have caused that you know some horrific Crimes. Well, I, I, I'd love to unpack this in time. I, I, I don't know yeah. enough about the history of it, but I do, I do get a sense that a lot of the worst things committed in the name of religion is done by individuals in power, and I do sometimes think that power is the corrupting element. Yeah, yeah, because the church was powerful. I mean, the Roman Empire turned into the Roman Catholic Church, so it had all the power, all the, all their links, all the, yeah, you know, all, all that, and people wanted that. People mm. wanted the money of that church so they could buy armies and have power. And then the church said, "Fine, but you have to convert to us and give us money, yeah, to do that." In effect, yeah, it's a, it was a business. I mean, it was like a, almost like a mercenary business. Church gave kings money to buy armies to kill people, and so everybody in the land then became members of the church. Mm. Uh, uh, what's your views on religions like Buddhism, uh, which brings along the sense of you can connect to something? greater than yourself you just you know you you're just too focused on the ego self and if you actually meditate and mm. and dis, disassociate yourself with your life and your your physical body you become aware of something greater yeah, so than I, yourself. I think that's yeah i mean i think so we, we, we're really focusing on the abrahamic religions when we, we talk about religion in the in the mm. european mm. capacity mm. And, and the effect yeah I, you know, I think buddhism and even hinduism to a degree are, are very different and Whilst they have their own peculiarities, I, I think they are more, far more peaceful and loving than in any Abrahamic religion. And why do you think, again, in sort of evolutionary terms, because my tree, by the way, I used to call the tree of religion the evolutionary tree of religion. That's what I, could, I think it was its first name when I brought it out because I just okay. noticed how it evolved over time. So obviously with evolution, there's the survival of the fittest. So we've lost hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of religions over thousands and thousands of years so the ones that are still with us today you could argue are the survival of the fittest in evolution no, it's the survival of the fittest survival of the ones that can change the quickest okay that's, that's probably a better you know and that's true you know that's why we have so many flavors of christianity because mm. if one doesn't survive someone creates another one that might survive it's just a you know a business model at the end of the day <laughs> so do, do you think do you think some religions are still with us today but are going to like a vestigial tail just eventually disappear or do you think they're still serving people do you think why do you think that we still have them uh, and let's be fair it's the the i i think uh buddhism christianity islam hinduism sikhism they're, they're still a huge part of millions or well, billions of people's lives so it's they're still mm -hmm. with us why do you think they're still here in a world of enlightenment and science and progress in terms of technological and material progress why do we still have these religions here if i answer that honestly i might get cancelled so, uh, <laughs> i a majority of people aren't ready to you know people many people aren't fully responsible they don't want to be fully responsible for their lives and their outcomes hmm uh, I think we should be clear. You're, you're an atheist, aren't you, John? So just, uh, just. Uh, uh, we should... <laughs> well, I have, I have beliefs. I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm religious per se, but I, there are 
aspects of the culture of certainly Indo-Europeans that I really love, you know, in, in terms of um, the, the understanding of immortality and how they treat the world and the cosmos as, as a cycle. You know, you you give what you take and things like that. There's aspects of that I, I really so that's, really those are principles. Me. Those are principles that you you find that are useful. You have mm -hmm. utility to them. But what about a belief in something greater than yourself that is be something that is mysterious and that has that gives purpose and meaning to our lives? Do you have a, a sense of that at all? Um, unfortunately, I don't think. No, no. I I would. It's a, it's a different discussion, but no. The the greatest god in my world is me. Fair enough. <laughs> the greatest yeah, god. In terms, if, if I had to apply that sort of thing, I'm responsible for my own well-being and yes. my family and my friends' well-being. No, nothing else. Your sense yeah, of agency comes from. It, yeah. But but it's me who who makes those decisions and looks after. Yeah. So I'm not going to blame it on some chocolate teapot or whatever imaginary thing you've got. To, to worship no i was going to say it's the me. spaghetti the spaghetti, the spaghetti What's monster yes the or spaghetti the monster i'm gonna do you know what i haven't added that on my tree and i think i should i actually think that needs to go on the tree um so i wanted to dig a bit deeper um i've just talked about the spaghetti monster and now i've lost my trail of thought john this is <laughs> so easy the europeans the europeans what so what religion did they believe so they their gods were more warlike and aggressive and the difference in culture is they were more pastoral farmers. So they they got their food from, uh, in effect, herding animals, mainly cattle. And so cattle were really important to them. And we see that in many Indo-European influenced cultures. The, the, the cow was a big thing uh, before the horse became available to ride. And the Indo-Europeans also uh, were the first culture really to take advantage of the will. So if they have the will and they have cattle, it allowed them to farm better and further. It allowed them to travel into Europe. It allowed them to trade with agricultural people, then give them the plague, and then invade Europe. <laughs> um, well, they did. Yeah, yeah. So, that's right. Uh, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, They got yeah, got a bit of a significant amount of, of their population there. Uh, yeah, then they came into Europe with their gods. And what is fascinating is, if you look at certain pantheons, you can still see the split today between. The agricultural gods and the war gods. So in the Nordic culture, you have the Aesir, which are the Indo-European war type gods, and the Vanir, which are very agricultural gods. And even in the Olympians, we see certain gods like Demeter taking a back seat because he's agricultural focused, Mother Earth mm. type god rather than Zeus. And, and there's they others. Stepped, you, um, they stepped out Hebe for um, Dionysus, didn't they? So he was like, yeah, yeah, check you out. Get changed like that. And yeah, yeah. Hittites who were very Near East influenced, you know, they had earth gods and sky gods in effect. And you, you get this split and, uh, yeah. Have you ever meditated? <laughs> no. I don't think my brain could sit still long enough to deal with it. Have you ever danced for hours and hours on end until you've gone into a trance state? No, because I'm too busy working and reading and, and writing have you, essays. <laughs> <laughs> have you taken psychotropic substances to experience a deep connection with nature? I hate even being drunk because I'm not in control of my brain. <laughs> I have to be in complete control of my brain. So what have you done to explore the world of this mysterious thing that we call religion and, and mysticism and spirituality? Have you ever sort of gone? Well, apart, apart from 30 years of research, um, I, I have found happiness, bliss. I have found pure bliss and happiness. And I have got that from... One, writing good computer code. Yeah, <laughs> and okay. Two, <laughs> and two, you know, uncovering myths and motifs that haven't been discovered and recreating stories that have been lost for it. it there is of there years. is a feel. I, I know what you mean. When, when you have a little eureka moment and you put something together and you're just like, oh my God, that's amazing. And you get a thrill from it. I get that. Yeah. And, uh, and those things, they, so I'll have some books out hopefully in the next two or three years. And they'll be down in history, and hopefully, you know, my fame will not decay, which is a, you know, Europeans would say, you know, I'll be remembered by some mythologists and people who are interested, you know, by adding some value to the world. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, the, the, so just so uh, my followers know, John's got a website, um, the, the Myth Database. 
yeah and i will be linking so just to give people a quick idea if i click on my infographic again i will be linking if, as long as you're okay with this the tree of religion to john's Oops. website so if you if you uh, for instance will come up here to the upper branches say now you want to study uh, celtic polytheism if you click on it on the online version i'm going to create you'll be able to have a brief overview of the celtic culture the beliefs the doctrines the rituals and festivals they had uh, and the myths but it's going to be you know, it's a wiki so it won't be you know massively in depth but if you really want to dig into the myths and the pantheons they can go to a myth database and read the entire story is that right so they can read it all in detail the database there'll be flavors of stories it's, it's got some whole stories in there often yeah. it is a referencing of how stories are linked and and where they come from and sources and and you know if, if you're a patron you can actually see where all the myths are told across the world yeah uh, particular types Right. Well, there we are. So uh, let me just bring myself back. Thank you very much, John. It's been an absolute pleasure. And um, are you okay, John, if we return to the tree another time? Because I would like to discuss the yes. other branches. So I'll just quickly go over where we were. We've pretty much climbed halfway up the tree. So we've done from the base down here up mm -hmm. to about the Indo-European uh, culture from 4000 BC. But yes. I wanted to go, I wanted to explore all the different variations of that culture. So that would be the, the, the Greco-Roman culture, Slavic, Baltic, Nor Norse, and so on. Mm -hmm. And then Excellent. I'd like to talk about the advent of Christianity and how it affected the cultural religious landscape of Europe. And then I wanted to talk, so there's the, the cross there of uh, the Christianity, literally just taken over all of Europe. But at the top, you can see I've got a lot of these um, neo-pagan movements, which I, 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 I was, yes, I'll do. True and like, yes. Yeah, I thought it'd be interesting discussing those. Um, so that means we're halfway through. Are you okay to do another bash at this in a, in a week or so? Brilliant. Absolutely. So I enjoy but this. I much appreciate that then, John. All right. Well, thanks for chatting to me and uh, I will catch you in the next session on Faithscape. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.